Well hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to OLC TV for some more Total War Three Kingdoms animated essay series, this time looking at the argument against Liu Bei. And you'll notice as well this is part one, this is going to be a long essay so I have broken it up into multiple parts, so expect a series of this coming out regularly over the next couple of weeks. Now what do I mean by the argument against Liu Bei? I mean this, I don't buy this bland, characterless almost vacuous imbecile that's so overcome with virtue and honor that he lacks a personality that they portray in Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Dynasty Warriors and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms series and Total War Three Kingdoms the game as well. I just don't buy it. The histories, if you read the histories, if you read his biography, if you read the biographies of his peers and how they interacted with him, he was a much more interesting character than that. He was very mercenary, highly ambitious, a man who did everything he could to better his own position and would not blink at, betray at, at betraying kinsmen, friends and allies alike if it served his end goal. And that is what we will look at, all of his betrayals, all of the way he treated his friends and allies and how he rose to become one of the top warlords of the era. Now. The argument against Liu Bei, or do not believe all you read in romance, because this is the first part, we will be starting at the beginning. I will not be doing a full biography, I will be picking key events that highlight these specific traits uh, of his personality that differ from the romantic version from history, but I will try at my best to keep them in chronolo chronological order for you so that it will sort of follow a biography if you wish to read along with his biography, which you can find online, by the way, um, if you just search for Rafe de Crespigny's, uh, uh, just Google Rafe de Crespigny and uh, Liu Bei, you will find the uh, dictionary, the historical dictionary um, for the Han Dynasty, and you'll be able to find his biography in there. Anyway, we're going to be looking at his background and his imperial connections because that's important to his character in Romance of the Three Kingdoms as well as the histories itself. The raising of his first forces and what they did, because again it's very different from Romance, and his serving Gong Sun Zan, his old friend, and joining Tao Qian, and how he went about joining Tao Qian, and the situation that left Gong Sun Zan in. So, his imperial connection. Now, Liu Bei was from the northeast of China at that time. He was born in Zhou County, which is sort of around modern-day Baoding, uh, which is a city in Hebei province near Beijing. And he was born there in 161 CE. Now, he claims descent from the Prince of Zhongshan, a chap called Liu Shang, who was Prince Jing of Zhongshan and the ninth son of Emperor Jing. Now, I got this from Chen Shou's own biography of Liu Bei uh, in the records of the Three Kingdoms, but it should be noted that Pei Songzhi does state that he could have been descended from the sixth son of Emperor Jing, uh, the Prince of Changsha. Uh, either way, okay, we need to look at the dates involved in this because Liu Shang died in 113 BCE. Now that and my maths is shocking, so do laugh at me if I've got the date, if I've got the uh, number of years wrong, but. To my maths, that's 274 years before Liu Bei was born. 274 years before he was born. That is quite a long time. In fact, during this time, the Han Dynasty has been overthrown and re-established itself. It's quite a major change. The main line of the Han Dynasty has altered between relatives throughout this time. So you could say there is precedent for uh, lesser known family members to take the throne but still it's quite a leap to suggest that he truly has a strong connection to the imperial line and certainly you could not argue that he has a better connection than the likes of Liu Biao and his family or Liu Zhang and his family who are both related to the fifth son of the Emperor Jing um, descended from the fifth son of the Emperor Jing. So again, they're dealing with a very, very similar time frame, and they never really claimed to be in a position to declare themselves emperor or really showed that they were willing to do so. There are some rumors about Liu Biao and Liu Zhang, but to be honest, that was more playing up to the court than really trying to overthrow the emperor. And certainly he did not have a better claim than the likes of Liu Chong, 
or his brothers and cousins who were frankly very very close to the main imperial line so i do find this act of playing up his imperial connections to be more of a propaganda effort and that certainly is something we'll be looking at later on because the likes of me jewel really really helped push this propaganda effort of him being an imperial relative now he wouldn't meet me jewel till after he joins tao chen so we'll be discussing more of that in the second episode and onwards but you should note that a lot of this stuff about him being an imperial relative was part of an active propaganda campaign led by his followers to push for him to be granted more and more power within different regions because of course you must remember he was a nobody and this is why he was a nobody his grandfather liu xiong was prefect of fan now that's quite a high ranking position in uh, the hand uh, structure at the time the hand governmental structure at the time not hugely high ranking but you know it's pretty good and fan is sort of around there don't take the dot on the map to be exactly accurate it's very difficult with the three kingdoms map to find exact places but he was a prefect of fan and uh liu bei's father i believe was called liu hong he unfortunately died young and that meant that liu bei was left his family was left destitute they had no income so they had the whole selling of sandals and weaving of beds and straw mats and all the like that they did to pay for everything but this did allow liu bei's mother to save up enough money and send him when he was 15 years old to luoyang to study under lu zhi and this is where he met gong sun zan and also some kinsmen uh, liu duran studied with him under lu zhi and liu duran's father did support liu bei a lot during this time making sure that he had all the money and materials he needed to study and also providing his mother with food and materials to survive back in their hometown as well now lu bei we know was not the most studious of individuals he spent most of his time with a group of people called the Yosha. Now this is translated as a sort of a knight errant type uh, translation, but it doesn't really give the correct idea for what these type of people were, because when we think of knights, we think of chivalry and the like. This is very, very different. These are a group of rich noblemen's children who enjoyed getting drunk and fighting, abducting women, uh, and generally causing mischief. Gong Sun Zan was part of this group um, in another group, but no less diff uh, no less the same idea. They were different in absolutely no way with the likes of Yuan Shao, Yuan Shu, Cao Cao. You know, this is what the noble children did whilst they were at university in Luoyang. They went nuts and did what they wanted because they could get away with it. This was a highly corrupt court. Their family all had connections. They could bribe their way out of anything. Who was going to stop them? Liu Bei was no different, and he made lots of friends in this clique. And they had a lot of fun together. Beat the shit out of each other, got drunk, womanized, and he made some lifelong friends, which included Gong Sun Zan. Now, we're going to skip a few years. And in these few years, um, Liu Bei has graduated. He's fought the Yellow Turbans, and whilst fighting Yellow Turbans, he has met the likes of Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, okay? So we can assume that they're all together at this stage, and we will be going more into the details of Guan Yu and Zhang Fei throughout this too, because again, I don't quite buy the way they're portrayed. But he has met them, and I've brought them up specifically because, even though it's not worth a whole thing, I wanted to mention about the Oath in the Peach Garden. The Oath in the Peach Garden has no historical basis whatsoever. This is something we can almost certainly assume has been romanticized. It's something that came later to show up the relationship that these three had. However, that should not detract from the fact that Guan Yu and Zhang Fei certainly 100% saw each other as brothers. They were that close. Whether they saw Liu Bei as a close master or an elder brother is up for more debate. But what I don't think is up for debate is just how close their relationship was as a whole. Okay, so although there are aspects of how they met, how they gained their weapons, because their weapons were fictional anyway, um, and the oath and all the rest of it, all of that we can say is fictional. Their relationship was not. 
Anyway, we're going to skip ahead to 187 CE. 187 CE, Liu Bei is working for his longtime friend Gong Sun Zan. Gong Sun Zan has been tasked to deal with the rebellion of Zhang Chun and Zhang Zhu, and he is off on campaign with Wu Huan allies fighting a Wu Huan rebellion led by some former Han generals and their soldiers, uh, one of which has declared themselves king. Now, during this time, and we don't know exactly when, Liu Bei is very seriously injured, he feigns his own death, his soldiers ride to save him, and he escapes. But for his efforts, he is rewarded with a position. Now, Gong Sun Zan is off to keep on fighting. Liu Bei stays behind and gets a position in Zhongshan. Now, his position that he gets is the lowest civil service position you can get. However, it is the first step on the ladder. And considering he has come from nothing, this is something. He doesn't stay in this position for long, however. Now, there's lots of legends about what exactly happened, whether the uh, court, the eunuchs, sent someone to go and bully him a little bit for a bribe, or whether there was a change of rules, meaning that people who were awarded positions based on what they did in the military could no longer hold those positions. Exactly what happened is up for debate. Um, what isn't up for debate, though, is that Liu Bei didn't take kindly to this chap arriving. He publicly beat him, knew he was going to be in trouble, hung up his seals, and legged it. He was not in that position for very long. He legged it, and the next time we hear about him, he is down in Pingyuan working for a local commander. Now, what he does here is he has the same rough position, and then he gets another position. He sort of bounces around a little bit. There is a promotion involved, but he, he bounces around a little bit. And then he loses all interest in that. His friend Gong Sun Zan is up in the northeast. He's defending the northeast borders. He has a sort of independent command. And also in 189C, you have all the chaos in Luoyang. And you have the changing of emperors. You have Dong Zhuo arriving. And as we go into 190, 191, etc., you have the coalition beginning, forming fighting and falling apart and we know for a fact that Liu Bei tried to raise soldiers to join in this coalition however and for reasons we don't know he decided against that and he joined Gong Sun Zan. Why he joined Gong Sun Zan in my opinion and I must say this is an opinion is he was a nobody if he was going to go to the coalition who would he be working for? You must remember when we look at uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, you have Sun Jian, you have Cao Cao, you have Gong Sun Zan, you have a lot of people at the table um, of this coalition who seem to be quite high ranking, but actually Gong Sun Zan was not there. Sun Jian worked for Yuan Shu, and Cao Cao, although he was friendly with Yuan Shao, was not senior enough to hold that level of command as is shown in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. So considering Sun Jian, who was at this stage the most famous of all of the three guys from the Three Kingdoms, he was a subordinate of somebody who turned out to be a nobody. What was Liu Bei going to be? He was probably only going to be a major or a captain in command of a small section of troops for someone else. That was not something he wanted to do. Why do that when you could go work for your friend and carve out your own future? That is personally why I believe he went north. I think as well, this shows that it's about him and not about the Empire. Because if it was about the Empire, no matter what, he would have gone to fight against Dong Zhuo, in my opinion. And romance, I think, supports this because by taking him away from where he historically really was, which was way up in the Northeast, and crowbarring him into a situation down around Luoyang, that suggests that people would have expected him to be there if he was to support the Han Dynasty, and he wasn't. So, he's up with Gong Sun Zan. And throughout all of that time, the coalition falls apart, and Yuan Shao, Gong Sun Zan, end up fighting over a deal over Han Fu's territory. Gong Sun Zan is aided by Liu Bei in a major victory over Yuan Shao that effectively gives him the whole of the northeast coast unchallenged. 
We should also take a note of the alliances. Gong Sun Zan has a long-term friend and ally in Tao Qian. Yuan Shao has a long-term friend and ally in Cao Cao. Liu Bei has fought alongside Gong Sun Zan. Yuan Shao has been beaten and falls back. Liu Bei is tasked to go with uh, Tian Kai, who is Gong Sun Zan's, one of Gong Sun Zan's chief subordinates, to take command of Ping Yuan. And he becomes, for all intents and purposes, a very good commander of Ping Yuan, guarding it against the raids from Yuan Shao's troops and generally being relatively effective. However, come the Battle of Jie Chao, where we don't know if he was there or not, but we do know that Gong Sun Zan lost a crushing victory. Liu Bei and Tao, uh, Tian Kai were forced further east, and Yuan Shao took a huge chunk of territory. From this stage, Gong Sun Zan ordered Tian Kai to go and support Tao Qian, because Tao Qian, his ally, was under attack from Cao Cao. Now, Cao Cao and Tao Qian have their own history, they don't particularly like each other even before Cao Song, Cao Cao's father, was killed. So there's been conflict between them for a long time. And because it's his ally, Gong Sun Zan decides to send troops. Now he sends Tian Kai off with his army. And Liu Bei is in charge of 1,000 Wu Huan riders. These are crack cavalry. Okay, some of the best cavalry in China at this time. And he has his own regiment plus refugees from Ping Yuan going with him. So he has a sizable but not huge force. But they're pretty effective. And they go in and they help fight against Yuan Tan and Cao Cao who are both in this area. But now we get to what can arguably be described as his first betrayal. Tao Qian says to Liu Bei, I will give you 4,000 troops from Dangyan Commandery. And I will make you inspector of you if you come and work for me. So what do you think Liu Bei does? Does he say, Gong Sun Zan is my long-term friend. He has done well for me. He has given me positions that I would not have got normally. He is in a spot of trouble at the moment fighting a large and powerful enemy. He has just had a loss and his troops are in trouble. The morale is low. The cavalry was defeated by a small group of soldiers and he will need every fighting man he has and his friends around him to help fight back against Yuan Shao because we have beaten Yuan Shao once, we have better troops, we can beat him again. Because that would show loyalty to his friend, the loyalty that he is renowned for having in romance. But no, he doesn't do that. He says, goodbye, old friend. And he chucks himself over into Tao Qian's court, leaving Tian Kai in that area with reduced troop numbers. Tian Kai is very swiftly defeated and pushed back north of the Yellow River. Bong Sun Zan, of course, does manage to rally his troops and come down for another try in the future. But whatever happens, Bong Sun Zan has lost a friend, an ally, and several troops. Personally, I don't believe Gong Sun Zan would have been too miffed because essentially Liu Bei has gone to a different area to fight against the same enemy. However, it cannot be denied that Liu Bei leaving and taking a huge contingent of cavalry, he was doing it not to better support Gong Sun Zan, certainly not for the Han Dynasty in fighting against Cao Cao. That just would have been absolutely rubbish at this time. The Han Dynasty at this stage was controlled by Guo Sun Li Jue. No, what he was doing was trying to get a better position. In the same way, I believe he joined Gong Sun Zan rather than join the coalition so that he could carve out his own little space. He got a taste of the power and he lost it and he decided to go somewhere where he thought it would be a little bit more stable and he'd get a promotion. And so that's exactly what happened. Now the aftermath of that is this. It wasn't just a good number of troops and crack cavalry that Liu Bei took. The commander of that cavalry was none other than Zhao Yun. So he took another officer from Gong Sun Zan as well. Not a particularly high ranking officer at this time, but still it's more examples of troops that he was taking from a friend. 
Um, we know that Gong Xuanzang would eventually be crushed by Yuan Shao, and Cao Cao and Tao Qian's fight would last for a long time. Uh, Cao Cao would go in and ravage Xu province, but he would not be able to defeat Tao Qian before he dies of old age. This is where we will leave it for this episode. Coming up in the next episodes, what we will cover for the rest of the series is becoming Cao Cao's personal retainer and the first betrayal. So, those of you who know his conflict with Yuan Shu and Lu Bu and Cao Cao and all the mess that made, what is missed out of romance is actually the fact that Liu Bei became one of Cao Cao's personal retainers. A seriously close member of Cao Cao's personal group of core confidants. And then he betrayed him, and he betrayed him quite severely. Seriously enough that Cao Cao would never forgive him and would try and crush him from that point onwards. And we'll be discussing that in quite a lot of detail because I don't think it's covered at all in any of the games, in any of the romantic versions I have ever seen. Joining Yuan Shao and the second betrayal. So after he has fled from Cao Cao after his betrayal, and I do say the first betrayal because you could argue that leaving Gong Xuanzang was a betrayal or not. Betraying Cao Cao, that was a betrayal. Joining Yuan Shao and how he betrayed Yuan Shao because he betrayed Yuan Shao too. He took a huge number of troops and shafted him. And we'll be looking at that. We'll be looking at the politics of Jinzhou because after he betrays Yuan Shao, he runs to his kinsman Liu Biao and gets directly involved in a succession fight between Liu Biao's children. And he is a cause of the fall of Jinzhou to Cao Cao in many ways. And we'll be looking at that and how he shafted his own kinsman. Then his alliance with Sun Quan and how instead of fighting and mopping up Cao Cao and helping to push Cao Cao back across the Yangtze and follow up in, in uh, attack alongside Zhou Yu, he shafted his ally and took land instead and then got this odd deal with Sun Quan where of course Liu Bei was just borrowing the land from Sun Quan. Yeah, that's quite an interesting bit of politics there and it does sort of show up the fact of just how little Liu Bei and his troops did in the Red Cliffs battle and just how overrated Zhuge Liang's efforts during that time were as well. And then of course his protecting of his kin Liu Zhang from Sun Quan. How dare Sun Quan say that he should attack uh, Liu Zhang when of course Liu Bei wanted to do it himself later and take his land. And then of course his declaration of emperor and the fact that he was giving up entirely on the idea of the Han Dynasty being part of the main line and he essentially usurped numerous other potential candidates to declare himself emperor. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you have enjoyed this. This is just the beginning. It's going to get a lot more meaty as we move on to the actual proper betrayals rather than just, you know, potentially shafting an old friend. The much more ambitious, viperous attempts to position himself, uh, himself in court closest to the people in power and try and usurp their power from underneath them. Anyway, I really hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please feel free to drop a like and subscribe down below. If you also, you've enjoyed this more essay style format, please let me know if there's any other characters you would like me to look into or a specific aspect of them you would like me to look into. I know I've had a request to look into uh, the Yellow Turbans characters as well. We did a little bit of their battle and warfare when Hong Fu Song was wailing on them in the Siege of Changshu. Um, but we could definitely look at that in the future. Uh, if anyone has any other ideas, please let me know in the comment section below. And thank you very much for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.